This is the continuation of the testimony of Trooper Proctor, and this is from June 10th. I'm doing this reaction style. I have no idea what kind of craziness we're going to hear out of this one. Let's go. With reference to, um, we before we broke, we are talking a bit about um, Julie Alvin and Chris Rowley, correct? Yes. And, uh, how would you describe um, your relationship, if any, between uh, Julie Alvin and Chris Rowley prior to January 29, 2022? Um, <clears throat> loose acquaintances. People that you knew through your sister, is that correct? Correct. Isn't it funny how so many people are friends with John O'Keefe, but they act like they don't give a rip and until they need to act like they care. And how people who are friends or friendly are suddenly just loose acquaintances. The occasions that you had said where you may have been at the same place at the same time at a family function or something like that. Over what period of time are we talking about and about how many different instances uh, of that occurred over those years? Like I mentioned, they had never been to my house. It was either at my sister's home or at my parents' house over the course of maybe 10 years. Um, I might have been at the same function half a dozen times. And at those times that you were at the same function a half a dozen times or so, um, how much interaction would you have uh, with either Chris or Albert or Julie Albert or even Colin Albert at those functions? Um, just casual conversation, be cordial, and just typical conversations, you know, hi, how's it going, things of that nature. Now, with reference to uh, these experiences uh, or relationships or lack thereof that you have uh, with Christopher Julie Albert, <clears throat> what if any conversations did you have uh, with your su- uh, supervisors as far as uh, superior officers within your unit uh, in regard to this? Um, I explained the connection or with my sister to the, the Albert family. Explain that too. Sir. That would be um, Sergeant Mechanic, Lieutenant Fanning, and Detective Lieutenant Tully. Is there a record of that somewhere? Is there a note somewhere? And why, if they have so many people in the office who can jump in and help and how it's not a one-man show, why didn't they simply assign someone else to do the interview? It wouldn't have been that hard. We're talking about the state police. We're not talking about a teeny tiny little town and there are only four officers available or something. I mean, even then they could get somebody else. And just with respect to those <coughs> disclosures, what specifically did you tell either Sergeant Mechanic, Lieutenant uh, Fanning, or Lieutenant Tulsa? Um, basically that there's she, the Alberts are my sister's friends, uh, that I've been at some functions with them and the, the only, um, kind of connection with the Albert family is, is through my sister. And just when you say the Alberts, as far as, uh, who specifically within the Alberts are you talking about that had a, had a friendship with your sister? Julie, Chris, and their son Colin. Now, with regard to, um, the investigation that you were conducting and the interviews that you conducted, what if any impact uh, did that, those relationships have with regard to your interviews of them specifically or the investigation in total? Zero. Absolutely zero impact on this investigation. Sir, I'm showing you a uh, document. Uh, do you recognize that? And what do you recognize it to be? Uh, it's a text message thread labeled uh, Proctor of Friends. Now, over the course of uh, your investigation, over the course of this case, are you aware that there were um, iCloud data that was obtained from your personal cell phone? Yes. And uh, different text strings uh, from that iCloud data from your personal cell phone, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and with respect to what has just... This is very unusual to get data from the personal cell phone of an investigator. Very unusual. It's been placed before you. Is that uh, an excerpt or a piece uh, from, from those particular messages? It is. And uh, from the front page of that, uh, can you tell the jury uh, who are um, sort of the participants in this particular text communication? Uh, the several numbers that aren't identified. The three that are are under uh, kind of nicknames that my buddies have for each other. Numbers are unidentified, but these are his friends. What? What? And generally speaking, just as far as the participants in this uh, text communication, uh, who are these people to you and, and how do you know them? How long have you known them? Who, who are uh, I've, The members on this text thread are close friends from junior high, first grade even. Uh, so people you've known for years, is that correct? Correct. And do each of them uh, live or do any of them live within uh, the general area uh, at the time? Some of them do, yes. And so when some of them do, some of them do not, is that correct? Correct. And the ones that do not, uh, how far away do, do they live? Uh, as far away as Tennessee. Now, <clears throat> with reference uh, to this, there's an indication as far as the first message sent or last message sent uh, from this particular text chain, correct? Sorry, repeat the question, please. Uh, sort of towards the middle of the first page. <clears throat> I'll direct your attention to that area. Is there any indication as far as the first message sent and the last message sent with respect to this text chain? On the first page, yes. And uh, what is indicated as far as the first message and the last message? Uh, the first message is, I need to brandish a gun more often. The last is, Chip, name of that BPD cop. No, I'm sorry, sir. If I could direct your attention to uh, the first page in this packet, page 2527, do you see uh, conversation details? Do you see what I was uh, talking about now? I do, sir. Okay. <clears throat> and from that uh, area labeled conversation details, there's a first message sent date and time and a last message sent date and time, correct? Yes. Okay. What is the first message uh, sent date? Uh, it's 10-18 of 2021 at 8.48 a.m. 
The last message sent is 831, 2022 at 11, 19 p.m. Is there also within that conversation details an indication as far as the number of messages over that time frame within this communication? There is. And what does it list for number of messages? It's uh, 38,707. It's fair to say the packet that you have before you does not contain all 38,707 messages, correct? That's correct. The first message uh, that you had, I believe, alluded to in reference to uh, the first one listed within uh, this communication, what date and time is that? That was January 29th, 2022 at 1036 p.m. And who is that message from? Uh, my friend who lives in Tennessee. And uh, what, if anything, did he send to the group? Uh, <clears throat> I need to brandish a gun more often. And uh, if you know, what is that in reference to? Um, he just recently moved to Tennessee, and he was kind of, I think, making a joke as um, kind of the lifestyle down there where guns are more prominent or more common to be carried around there. So I interpreted that as a joke in that nature. And the next message, sir, from that uh, same page, 2527? Uh, the next one is, uh, it's bold. And is there a name associated with that number that's in these? No. Do you know who that person is? I don't. And the next message, sir, from uh, 1052 p.m.? Uh, Chip, name of that BPD cop. And Chip, who is that uh, referring to, sir? That is one of my nicknames I've had since maybe high school. So a nickname that would be familiar amongst these group of friends in particular? Yes. And... <clears throat> This time period when these text messages begin, uh, sometime after 10.30 or 10.50 p.m. on January 29th, um, where are you and, and what are you doing uh, in reference uh, around that time period? Uh, at this point in time, at, on the 29th, uh, I'm home. And uh, that last text message, uh, do you respond to that at approximately 10.53 p.m.? Yes. And what was your response? Uh, John O'Keefe. And uh, the next message down from there, also at 10.53 p.m.? Yes. He took custody of his sister's kids. Uh, that's your response. There's another response above that. Is that correct? Yes. And what does that say? How old? And you respond as far as he took custody of his sister's kids, correct? Correct. <clears throat> um, skipping down a couple, do you see? Hold on a second. Proctor's at home on his personal phone, and he's talking to somebody unknown about the case. And he's providing information. So whoever it is that he's talking to, because he says, unknown, is not involved in the investigation, is not a state police officer because they already know. They don't need to be informed. And this is a violation here. It's true that with close friends, you might talk about cases in general terms, but mostly you try and stay away from that because the concern is always, I'm afraid I'm yelling at you. The concern is always, gee, I don't want to slip up and say something that isn't public information. So he shouldn't be talking about it at all and certainly shouldn't be giving detail, especially in respect to an investigation that's ongoing. Uh, an entry at 10.53.49 p.m.? Yes. And that's from a 617 number, is that correct? Correct. And what is the response there? Uh, oh, man, that's rough. And uh, following that, do you respond uh, to, to the earlier query as far as age? I do. And what did you say? Mid-40s. Now, the next message below that as far as indication of uh, mid-40s, what is that? His age. No, I understand that. I'm sorry. The next message understand, un underneath that, sir. I'm sorry. Um, it's a Facebook link. And do you recall what that Facebook link is to? It's to um, John O'Keefe. And is that something you sent or one of your friends sent? One of my friends sent. And uh, the next message below, turning to now page 2529 at the top there, uh, what is the next message that's sent? <clears throat> What's that? Don't have the book anymore. And uh, as far as the book, what, what did you understand that to mean? Uh, sure. I don't believe for a minute that he doesn't know who he's talking to. If he doesn't know who he's talking to, really, then that would suggest that he talked to a lot of people and provided inside information and details about an ongoing investigation. So either he's lying about who he's talking to, or he talked to a whole lot of people so that he can't remember who this is. Either way, it's bad. Trooper, if I can direct you back to uh, page 2529 within that packet before you. <clears throat> and uh, below that text uh, stating, what's that? I don't, uh, don't have the book anymore. Uh, you respond, is that correct? Yes. And what is it that you say there? Uh, <clears throat> this one is a nightmare. I forget about the kids. That's awful. And sir, if I could direct your attention uh, again 
uh, within that same packet to 2532. And there's a uh, message there sent at 1056 p.m., is that correct? Yes. And who's that from? Uh, a friend who lives in Tennessee. And what does he say in that text? I'm sure the owner of the house will receive some shit. And uh, you respond at 1056 as well as 1057, is that correct? Correct. And what is it that you respond? Uh, my first response was, nope, um, homeowner is a Boston cop too. What were all the texts leading up to this other person from Tennessee knowing much about the homeowner? And because he's a cop, he's not going to receive any, you know, if I'm on the prosecution side, I'm going to say, no, people will trust the homeowner because he's a cop. So it doesn't mean anything. If I'm on the defense side, I'm going to say that the nope means, yeah, he's one of yours, you're going to protect him. And here's my problem. And it's been a problem that I've had from the beginning. The officer laying on the front lawn is also a cop. So how is he any less important than the cop that lives in the house? Especially considering that the one on the front lawn is dead. It just still blows me away that they didn't pull out all the stops and they didn't even do the basics, the fundamentals. And earlier in this trial, Lally kept purposely bringing out the fact that Brian Albert and Brian Higgins had gone to this funeral in New York for a fallen officer and never tied in what the heck that had to do with this trial. And I'm a bit disgusted. When you talk about a fallen officer, that's a big emotional hook. And the reason that the use of that fallen officer in New York bothers me is because they're using him. They're using that officer. They're using that officer's tragedy to exploit emotions in people. And that is disrespectful to the fallen officer in New York. And if they care so much, if they're brothers, then where is the care for John O'Keefe, for Officer John O'Keefe? Where is it? Because what I've seen is the opposite. I've seen a whole lot of self-serving. All right. I'm prone to go off on rants. I'll shut up now and keep listening. What, if anything, uh, were you saying or what, what was the purpose of, of that text in regard to the homeowner? I was just letting him know that essentially Mr. O'Keefe is a Boston cop and the homeowner was a Boston cop as well. Now, if I could turn your attention to 2533. What was John O'Keefe working on? Was he working on a case? Did he know something about Brian Albert Did or somebody connected with Brian Albert? They never talked about what he might have been working on at work. And, you know, maybe it is unrelated. One of the things that I've been wondering, and one of the things that is a factor in my thinking about conspiracy theories, as soon as you talk about conspiracies and giant cover-ups, my knee-jerk reaction is to roll my eyes and say, oh, come on, why, why do they want to do that, right? There's got to be a motive. And you know, people in the comments are talking about, well, maybe it was an accident. I don't think so. I'm starting to not think so. Because if it was an accident, they could have called it in and just said what happened. If it was self-defense, they could have called it in and said what happened. And because they're cops, they would be believed. And they might even get sympathy. Oh my gosh, we tried so hard to save him. And at the waterfall, Jen McCabe wanted so much for Karen to go with her. Why? They're not friends. Jen obviously has contempt for Karen. The thought of what was John working on or did he know something keeps coming up and has been coming up in my mind for a while. But there has been no evidence in this trial related to anything like that. But it might be that nobody knows if he knew something. If he saw something somewhere, no one would know that unless he told somebody. So I could be way, way off base here. That's just what I keep thinking, what keeps nagging at me. And top of the page, sir, if you could uh, read through that page as far as who's uh, texting and what do they say? Um, Again, for my friend from Tennessee and myself, um, I hope not, but I can't see it. I responded with, she waffled him. Uh, I looked at his body at the hospital. He was banged up. Um, now, as far as the next uh, text from a 781 number, mm-hmm. uh, what does that say? Um, did he get beat up? <coughs> and uh, you responded to that, is that correct? I did. The objection sustained as to form. What, if any, response did you provide to that? Nope. The objection, the objection was to the former question and the answer. 
Thank you. I'll strike it. Thanks. Now turning your attention to 2534. And from this page, sir, if you could again just uh, read through as far as indicating to the jury who's speaking and what is being said. From the start of the first text, so, so the owner of the house? Yes. So the owner of the house was a woman cop that beat him? That's what I initially thought after talking to Ken Paramedic. Then I saw the guy. What? So a Canton paramedic thought that there was a woman cop in the house who beat up John O'Keefe? How come that wasn't put into any report then? And who was that paramedic? We haven't heard this before. It wasn't part of any discussion or anything. Is this something maybe that the paramedic said and that he was confused? And those last two are your responses, is that correct? Yes. Now, the following text messages are from, yes. So the owner of the house was a woman cop that beat him? That's what I initially thought after talking to Ken Paramedic. Then I saw the guy. <clears throat> and those last two are your responses, is that correct? Yes. Now, the following text messages are from your friends, is that correct? Yes. What do they say? Um, <clears throat> Bear, let's focus. What does she waffle to mean? What's the story? I responded, she hit him with her car. And the she that you're referring to there, who was that? Ms. Reed. Now turning your attention to the next page, 2535. Uh, again, if you could start at the top of the page and read through that page and just indicate to the jury uh, who is talking and what is being said. Okay. Um, my friend in Tennessee states, okay, that's fucked up. I respond, intentional or not. Uh, then another response, gotcha. He was frozen in the driveway and she didn't see him, question mark. Uh, that's another animal we won't be able to prove. And then I respond, they arrived at the house. It's a little bit unclear as to who is saying what, because he's kind of flying through this. How come his text messages aren't put up on that big screen? Everybody else's text messages were put up on the big screen. You could read them and see them as well as hear them. And that makes it easier for the jury to take in and process that information if you have the words and the person reading it. And that way, if you miss something, you can look at it. Why aren't these up on the screen like everything else. House together, gone to an argument. I don't speak out loud or out of turn. If the objection's overruled. Your Honor, I, but if I can say this, there needs to be an identifier of who's I, And I understand what you think the mix-up is. So, Mr. Lally, go back. Thank you. Sir, if you could please, uh, again, start at the top of the page and just indicate... No, just, just after the gotcha, he was frozen in the driveway, correct, Mr. Jackson? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. I respond, that's another animal we won't be able to prove. I follow that up. They arrived at the house together, got into an argument, she was driving and left. Uh, 781 number responds with, what's the name of the can cop living in can? the other one involved. They got in an argument and she left. There's not, they got in an argument and then she ran him down. I mean, even while he's talking to his friend, he's not saying that. He said, he did say earlier, yeah, she hit him with her car. So when did she hit him with the car? Because they got in an argument and she left. And by the way, there is no evidence that they got into an argument as she was dropping O'Keefe off. This is somebody else's narrative. Not only that, it is somebody else's narrative who wouldn't know. This was Jen McCabe's idea. She dropped him off and left, not she hit him. And how do you respond to that, sir? Uh, there's several other messages before I uh, issue a response. Objection again. Bottom of the page. So it's not an objection, but Mr. Lally, why don't you point him? So, sir, at the bottom of page 2535, you have a response. Is that correct? Correct. And what is that response? They arrived at the house together, got into an argument. She was driving and left. Objection. So it's going to be a matter you can address on cross. There has to be some accuracy. So I, I understand. So, Mr. Lally, why don't you go point for your witness? I approach on. Yes. This witness is supposedly a trained homicide investigator. He's been to court before. He knows they need to know who's speaking when he's going through these text messages. What's the problem? Okay. Uh, it's a HTML link, link uh, whiteout backslash Proctor iCloud backslash group chat Feb 2022. So you point out. Can I see what you have for a second, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Let's 
So Elliot's on there. Why don't you go show oh. your witness? Why don't you just? Did you see that? She walked back to her seat and she just threw her pen on the on the bench. Like, oh come on! And this time, I get where she's coming from because I kind of feel like the same way. Both the prosecutor and this witness know better. If this witness is that dense, he shouldn't be working on homicides. Just read it, Mr. Lally, and tell us who you attribute it to. So, sir, what I'm asking you about is the bottom of page 2535, um, excuse me, 26, 2535, you indicated biffed him, correct? Correct. What, what, did, what did you mean by that? That Ms. Reed had struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle. <clears throat> Now, sir, if I could direct your attention to page 2537. Now, do you see a response toward the bottom of the page uh, from yourself, January 29, 2022 at 11.04 p.m.? Yes. And can you read that response for the jury? Yeah, but there'll be some serious charges brought on the girl. And what did you mean by that, sir? That throughout the course of the day, we had um, compelling evidence that Ms. Reed struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle. And uh, you have two responses from friends, uh, the same friends uh, at the bottom of that page, 2537, is that correct? That's correct. And what are those responses? Keep um, your voice up loud, please, um, Trooper Proctor. Jurors can't hear you. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, number ending 5051, got to be, I can only imagine what internal fears of the BPD are trying to get out there. The second response, same number, she hot at least. I had to slow that down so I could hear it. I can only imagine what internal affairs at BPD is trying to get out there. What? If this is a simple accident or even a domestic homicide that took place, hmm, this just makes me ask a whole lot of questions in my head. My brain is going crazy with questions. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, number ending 5051, got to be, I can only imagine what internal affairs of the BPD are trying to get out there. Second response, same number. She hot at least. Jerks. You know what? They do crap like that. They shouldn't, but they do. Turning your attention to the next page, 2538 uh, at the top. Um, if you could uh, just read a number of series of responses from yourself, correct? Yes, sir. Read from those, sir. Yep, so these came from me. From all accounts, he didn't do anything wrong. She's a whack job. C-U-N-T. Objection. From all accounts, what accounts are those? And she's a whack job? And again, he shouldn't be saying crap like this about a case that is not closed to anybody outside of his investigative team. I mean, cops talk. Even if you're not on the team, they talk. But he certainly shouldn't be talking to his friends about it. Then they are into, is she hot? And you know what? That just tells you everybody in the group. They're jerks. But this, she's a whack job. Why do they think that? Because she was upset at the scene or something? Like, he's labeled her. And the, I think he spelled out the C word. I know if you are in the UK, the C word has kind of a different meaning. But here, that to me is one of the worst words you can use. To me, that is worse than the F word. And this is January 29th. And he's saying it to at least some civilians. So he's got a bias. So he started with tunnel vision. He's got a bias immediately. And how could he have such a bias against this particular accused when he doesn't know her? Well, you know why? Because that's who he is. This tells me, just the willingness to use that word, as well as the fact that he's using such derogatory language about a woman he doesn't even know. He knows nothing about her. That tells me that he has a problem with women. And that is a problem for an investigation. That's an issue for an investigator for a case. Wow. And that would hold true if we saw and we see this as well all the time, somebody who obviously has issues with people of color or people who live in poverty. So don't spell it. You have to. So this, these are your words, Trooper Proctor? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead and say them. Cunt. Uh, yes, she's a babe. Weird Fall River accent, though. Though. No ass. 
Not sure who's saying this. I'm glad that the judge made him say the word. And look at him. I'm not seeing shame. I'm seeing aggravation. I think he doesn't want to say these things. I mean, it's got to be hard, right? He testified earlier that he has kids. His supervisors are going to hear this. I mean, they know by now, obviously. So why is he even still working? Why is he allowed to be on any active case? If this is the level of his bias, if this is how he jumps to conclusions. In my last video on this guy, I pointed out times when he demonstrated that he had tunnel vision right from the beginning. There were all kinds of signs of tunnel vision on his part, for sure. And saying no ass, are you looking at her as a suspect or as a victim or as a witness? Or are you looking at her like a piece of meat? What is she, some eye candy? Is this something you're at the fair and you're judging which cow or which horse is the best? What the crap is that? And look, I'm not, I worked in a male dominated system. I worked in the criminal justice system. I know they talk like that. I know they talk like that. And when I say they, I gotta say, it's not all of them. It's a whole lot more than I think the public would be happy with. Let's put it that way. There's a culture to the extent that it's getting better. It's slow. So this tells me about who he is more than it says anything about Karen Reed. He's showing who he is. And you know what? His friends there, his unknown friends and the guy from Tennessee, whatever, that obviously they're just as bad. And you know, this juvenile humor, heck, it's not even juvenile. I can't even say it's juvenile. In 1970, you could say it was juvenile because people didn't know better. But even my son growing up, wouldn't talk like that. As a 14-year-old boy who was liked girls, he would say to his friends, hey, what are you saying? That's not cool. Don't talk like that. And look at these guys. He's supposed to be a professional. So this is who he is. I'm sorry. I'm getting ticked off. You know what? I have been subjected to this at work when I was new. And I had to learn how to handle these idiots as a woman working in this. As you gain experience and as you gain rank and authority and power, they don't do that to your face so much anymore. But you know, you know what they're doing and what they're talking like behind your back. And it's one thing to talk like this on a personal level about some girl you met in the bar. It's still bad. It's still crap. It still shows who he is. If I met this guy out for a drink or something, and I knew he talked like that, you know what? I wouldn't let him within a mile of me. Because the minute you think or treat somebody as a thing and not a human being, that paves the way for a whole lot of awful. That's disgusting. It would be bad enough if he was saying that about someone he knew outside of work. But here he is on his personal phone talking to civilians, providing information about an ongoing investigation and speaking about a suspect in this fashion. And it's not even a, an expression of anger, because you hear that too. You hear, you know, especially if, if a police officer is killed, if an old lady is attacked, if a child is harmed, you're human. You get mad and you say things like, yeah, well, we're going to throw the book at him or that insert a swear word, right? That jerk, we're going to dot all our I's and cross all our T's and make sure that he is prosecuted to the full extent possible. And yeah, too bad, so sad he's going to jail, that kind of stuff. They talk like that. But this is not that. This is not outrage at what happened to John O'Keefe. This is just hate for this woman. And you know, because contempt and hate for women is so ordinary. It's so common. A lot of people feel like it's normal and they fluff it off. Like, well, yeah, that's just the way the world works. Well, that doesn't make it okay. And it certainly shouldn't be coming from an investigator. And I am ranting again. I will shut up. And sir, what is it that you were referring to there? Why would you text that? These were, um, from all accounts, he didn't do anything wrong, is um, talking about Mr. the homeowner, Mr. Albert. Um, I had mentioned the compelling evidence against Ms. Reed at this point indicated that Mr. Albert had nothing to do with Mr. O'Keefe's death. When he read the text, he didn't do anything wrong. In my head, I thought that he was referring to the victim. 
because it was connected there. He didn't do anything wrong and she's the the bad guy, right? It wasn't even about John O'Keefe. So I guess John O'Keefe doesn't enter into this at all. Not that they should be having this conversation at all with civilians. But he's talking about the homeowner and he's saying, by all accounts, he didn't do anything wrong. What accounts? Yeah, he's already made up his mind. There are loads of red flags. There's lots of evidence pointing in the direction of the homeowner and none of it was investigated. And this tunnel visioned, woman hating officer is already invested a certain way. This is January 29th. He's made up his mind. The rest of the unprofessional and regrettable comments are something I'm not proud of uh, and I shouldn't have wrote in uh, in a private or any type of setting. So he gets to preface what he's going to say with his little speech here and I'm pretty sure that Lally prepped him or somebody prepped him. So he's saying the rest of the comments I regret blah 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 and they're just words coming out of his mouth because as he was reading the comments he just read which were bad enough I don't know what's coming here but what he just read and what he just showed us he did was is bad. And I saw no shame in his face. I did hear the drop in his voice because he doesn't want to proclaim that he's an a-hole from the rooftops. He doesn't really want anyone to hear who he really is. So, you know, he spells out the word so he doesn't have to say it. And good on the judge for making him say it. Because if it was any other witness, they'd have to say it. And now he's, oh, blah, 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 regrettable words. And I don't even know what he's going to say. But I'm looking at him and I'm listening to him. And I'm hearing a, a rote response. It's, the, I know this is what I'm supposed to say, so here goes. I'm not seeing any actual regret. And I'm sorry, I am already mad, and apparently, by the sounds of it, there's more coming. Sir, at some point, um, if I could turn your attention to page 2540, and there's a, a photograph that's shared within this text communication, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, does it indicate who shared that photograph? The number ending in 5051. And who is depicted in that photograph that was shared within the group text? It's uh, Miss Reed being escorted out of the state police, Milton Barracks. And these are all from February 1st of 2022, around that time frame, is that correct? So someone is sending in a group text, the accused being lead, let out of the, the barracks. This is February 1st. Was this photo from a news article or something? Or is this a photo somebody took? Because that makes a difference. Yes. And sir, if I could direct you to the top of the page and ask you to read through that page, indicating who's speaking and what the content of those communications are. <clears throat> uh, okay. The number ending in 4146. Uh, question, is that chick a smoke? Uh, again, 4146, question mark. I respond, E-H. Uh, um, I respond again, not bag, as chief would say. Um, I also respond with, She's got a leaky balloon knot, uh, leaks poo. They're having this conversation. They're all idiots. They're all jerks, all of them. And it caught my attention that there was a derogatory term, and they referred to that term as, well, as the chief would say. So I don't know which chief this is, but whichever chief that is, that tells you something about the organization. If that's the view that the chief holds, and and that those working under him know that that's the view. I mean, he's not keeping that to himself. Sounds like that's part of the culture. When you work in this system, there are things that go on and things that police officers and other first responders will understand this too. Firefighters, EMTs, ER nurses. There are things that you see and hear and experience that are really tough. And you do develop a morbid or dark sense of humor and it's a way to cope and there is kind of this harsh culture it's not warm and fuzzy and they talk to each other and joke with each other because you can't take the, all those experiences home you can't 
talk about it with your friends. So you talk to each other and, you know, you don't have to explain. But obviously he's talking to civilians here. Sorry, I'm ranting again. And he disclosed in a group chat that included civilians on a personal phone, private, intimate health information about a civilian member of the public. And it doesn't matter whether that civilian is a witness, whether they're an accused, whether they're a victim, it doesn't matter. He's in possession of very intimate personal information about this woman. And not only is he disclosing very, very personal details that he has no right to disclose, and if I were her, I would sue them for this. Anyway, he's doing it in such a a derogatory fashion. There's utter contempt. I hope that we're going to hear that somebody in this chat says, hey, man, like, this isn't cool. I kind of doubt it, but we'll see. And sir, if I could direct you to the top of the page and ask you to read through that page, indicating who's speaking and what the content of those communications are. <coughs> uh, okay. Number ending in 4146. Uh, question, is that chick a smoke? Uh, again, 4146 question mark. I respond, EH. Uh, um, I respond again, not bag, as Chief would say. Um, I also respond with, she's got a leaky balloon knot, uh, leaks poo. Um, and what, if anything, is that in reference to? Again, um, to misread some medical conditions there. Um, again, unprofessional comments I should not have made um, that I'm not proud of. Unprofessional comments I should not made and I'm not proud of. Well, that is a rote response. This is something he knows he's supposed to say and I don't see a whole heck of a lot of shame here. I see a little bit of, eh, I don't want to read this out loud. And this is more than unprofessional comments. He's talking about her private information to people have, who have no business knowing anything. And what he's doing goes beyond words. This is not just, I slipped and used a swear word and that was unprofessional and I'm sorry. That's not what that was. It's not like I was really upset about my fellow officer and I yelled or I was rude or I was short or I said something that was phrased badly. Those are unprofessional words. This is way beyond the words. The problem is not really the words. The problem is that's his attitude. That's his thinking. That's the lens that he is looking through. That's his bias. And I would say this is pretty extreme bias. So it's not the words. It's not just that it was unprofessional words. It's unprofessional attitude, unprofessional conduct, because he's actually texting all this stuff. It's not the words. As far as attitudes expressed within these text messages and other text messages, um, what, if any, impact did that have as far as your investigation was concerned uh, regarding this? <laughs> these juvenile, unprofessional comments have zero impact on the facts and the evidence and the integrity of this investigation. How could his attitude not have an impact? That is the better question. How could it not? And this man who says he's trained homicide detective went to homicide school. He's worked for a while. He knows that your attitude does matter. The lens through which you look does matter. And you know, when they train you on interrogation and any number of things, first contact with the civilian, all of it, they talk to you about your power. And I was trained that the first step, you know, when you talk about use of force and going from least invasive to most invasive, when you're dealing with the civilian, they tell us your presence alone is a show of force. 
So they're telling you, you have power and you have to know that and pay attention to that and think about that. And through your words, your expressions, your behavior, all kinds of things can influence an investigation. It can influence a witness, what a witness says, how they say it, whether or not a witness identifies a person in a lineup. I mean, there are reasons why they do these double blind identifications. It impacts what you look at in terms of what you're seeing at a scene or how you view an individual. It impacts how you assess the credibility of people. It, I mean, I could go on and on all day. It impacts absolutely everything. So this statement is crap. This is garbage. And studies have borne that out. And you want to know why there are defense lawyers, why defense lawyers are so important? It's this. And this is blatant in your face, obvious, but there's some less blatant stuff out there. And somehow this guy's personal messages have been obtained and are being read in court. That's not the norm. So I don't know how they got that, but here we are. So sometimes the bias isn't as blatant or isn't known. And you know, look at this guy. He's sitting there dressed in a suit with a nice title. Hey, I'm a homicide detective. I work for state police. You want to believe him. You want to believe that the people that are supposed to protect your rights are not the ones violating them. Again, um, to misread some medical conditions there. Um, again, unprofessional comments I should not have made um, that I'm not proud of. There have been studies done on bias, on how that affects everything. And I've talked earlier about tunnel vision and bias can lead to tunnel vision. And it's real bad for an investigator to be biased. And one of the things you do or that you should do is talk to each other. And somebody else will say, yeah, but maybe you're not looking at this straight. Or yeah, maybe consider this other thing. Or maybe look at it from this perspective. You're supposed to toss things around like that instead of getting into this. I, I don't even want to insult 15-year-old boys by saying a group of kids because 15-year-old boys are better than this. Uh, this echo chamber of like-minded jerks. That's not what you're supposed to do. That just leads to entrenching your crap that's in your head and in your personality. And how can that not taint everything in an investigation? This guy should not be investigating anybody. This guy has just showed everybody. He can't do it. He's not qualified. He has no flipping integrity. He has no flipping spine. And you know what? The rest of the people in that conversation, unless I'm hearing somebody else stand up, they have no flipping spines either. How does the conversation even get this far? As far as attitudes expressed within these text messages and other text messages, um, what, if any, impact did that have as far as your investigation was concerned uh, regarding this? <laughs> these juvenile unprofessional comments have zero impact on the facts and the evidence and the integrity of this investigation. Uh, they said these are unprofessional comments, but they absolutely do not detract from the integrity of the investigation or the facts and evidence of it. Now, Trooper Proctor, contained within, uh, you've seen text messages amongst uh, yourself and a variety of, uh, of different people uh, from that same sort of uh, iCloud era of your personal phone, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and among those are there uh, communications uh, that you had with members of the Ken Police Department? Yes. And how would you characterize, uh, or what, what was the, the general content of communications that you had with members of the Ken Police Department? Uh, one communication was to coordinate uh, interview times for firefighters and police officers and to set up a conference room where those interviews could be conducted. Uh, obviously, the presence of Canton detectives or any police officers were not going to be um, sitting in on these interviews. Another communication was to inquire of um, relevant 
security videos that are in the area. Um, their local department, they know the area very well, so I reached out and asked if uh, there's some good cameras in the area that I had a uh, kind of interest in. Why is he texting Cat and PDE, and why is he texting them from his personal phone? Did I just misunderstand that? I'm showing you another document. Just ask if you recognize that. Yes, I do. What do you recognize that to be, sir? Uh, text communications between my sister and I. That's your sister, Courtney, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, similar to what I'd asked you about the prior uh, packet, as far as a first message sent date and time, last message sent date and time, uh, what is indicated on, on this first date? First message sent date time, December 10th, 2021 at 9.33 p.m. Last message sent 8.30 2022 at 8.48 p.m. And 8.30, that's August 30th, is that correct? I'm sorry, yes, August 30th, 2022. And similarly to the other messages, is there an indication as far as how many uh, number of messages were sent between yourself and your sister over that time period? 2,865. And fair to say that the documents in front of you do not contain 2,865 messages? Correct. Lally's pulling a trick here, or trying to. So he's trying to anchor this big number of the total text messages and then compare that with the packet that the guy has in his hand to make it seem like, well, it was only a few messages. I don't know what's in these messages. He did the same thing with the last batch of messages that we just heard, and the messages were horrible. I mean, Cranky, you could talk all day about any one of those messages and the implications of that. So the fact that, well, out of all these messages, only a small number are bad. You had all these messages and only some of them were bad? Well, how bad were they and what's the context and what was it about? Hey, that's like an saying, hey, I've been good all my life, except for the five banks I robbed. But all the other days of my life, I didn't rob any banks. So I only robbed five banks. Come on. Now, just in reference to the uh, first message on page 2662, the first page in this packet, uh, do you see that from December 10th of 2021 at approximately 9.33 p.m.? Yes. And uh, what does that indicate? A text message for my sister. And what does it say? I called earlier, Dolph earlier, and mom was puking in the background. And uh, do you recall what that was in regard to? From the sounds of my mother, I had the stomach bug. And sir, if I could direct your attention to uh, page 2667. And these are text messages from January 29th, 2022, uh, between yourself and your sister, Courtney. Right? <clears throat> Correct. And if you could read from uh, the top of the page through the end and please indicate to the jury as far as who's talking and who's saying what. So I texted my sister at work, what's up? She responds, what? Why? I respond, or just found a frozen to death on a front lawn in Canton this morning. Uh, actually just interviewed Jen McCabe, said she knows you. And they knows you. Who are you referring to? My sister. And how did your uh, sister respond to that? Uh, cut the shit. I responded you. It was a typo correction with my response to you. Uh, she responded, yeah, she knows Jack very well. She's really good friends with Julie. Uh, my sister continues on. Her sister is married to Brian Albert. My sister asks, you still work in question mark? I says, yeah, yeah, going to be out for a while. Uh, homicide. Sister Courtney Proctor confirms this. The relationships are confirmed here. And it's confirmed that he's talking to his sister about this case. And if there is any connection, he should not be talking to her at all about it. And don't come at me trying to claim that everybody does this because they do not. Answers to those questions uh, or as far as your communi communications that you have with your sister at this time on the afternoon of January 29th. What were those in regard to or why were you communicating that to your sister? Um, at that time, it was just kind of in the news. Um, I was just kind of letting her know I was out working. Um, I didn't share anything specific. I 
wouldn't share anything specific on cases with my family or anyone. He just finished going through all these other text messages and he's saying he didn't share anything specific that he wouldn't, except he has. And this is January 29th and he's still at work. So what exactly was in the news at the point that these two are having this conversation? I'm kind of not believing him, but I would need to look into it a little further to be able to say that for sure. Um, it was just kind of an overall innocent conversation. Now, turning your attention to the next page, 2669. Uh, again, if you could read from that page as far as uh, who was talking and what the content is. Right. <clears throat> uh, my sister starts off. The can't thing is a homicide. Uh, I respond. This is at three in the afternoon on the 29th. Uh, don't say a word to anyone. She said, of course not. I respond. Three in the afternoon on the 29th. He's texting his sister. And if it is no problem that he's talking to her, if he's not doing anything wrong, if he's not disclosing something that he shouldn't be disclosing, why is he saying don't say a word to anyone? Doesn't need to be secret if it's public knowledge. It's not in the news yet, is it? Maybe it is. This is on the 29th. This is before Proctor and Buchanan go to Dayton. So Courtney Proctor's in on the information, or at least some of it, obviously private, because otherwise he wouldn't need to say, don't say a word to anyone, on the 29th. And she's friends with the families? You think she's not talking to them? Vaughn, uh, in the very least, it's suspicious. She responds, this is your livelihood. Uh, and then I would never miss with that. Uh, 307, I respond, uh, Julie and Chris were at the bar with the victim and girlfriend. Uh, Got to interview them. He just finished saying on the stand, oh, I would never give specific information to my family or anyone. And he's giving specific information to his family about an ongoing investigation and the people to which she has connection. She's friends with them. And he's just let his sister know that those people are going to be interviewed. These are messages from February 1st, 2022. Is that correct? Correct. And the one at the top starts about uh, February 1st, 5.57 p.m. Is that correct? Yes. And again, if you could uh, read through as far as uh, who's speaking and what the content of those messages are. Uh, I texted my sister, what's up? Uh, she responded, nothing. I just saw Julie and she said, when this is all over, she wants to get you a thank you gift. And I respond, get Elizabeth one. Uh, Elizabeth's my Obviously, the sister is relaying information back and forth and discussing all of this with the Alberts and Proctor. That's really bad. This is compromised all the crap right away. And then the bit about the gift? She wants to get you a thank you gift. Thank you? Thank you? For what? For what? What is he doing for them? And I have a question. Why? Why is he doing it? So a thank you gift. As for the statement about a gift, I want to break it down into some parts. First of all, a thank you gift for what? And the expectation by the person speaking or texting here, Courtney, is that the receiver, Proctor, will understand the message, right? So the expectation is that he's going to understand thank you gift. So there's that piece. There's the fact that she's clearly acting as an intermediary here when that is out of the ballpark of bad. Another piece is you can't control what other people say to you. So if somebody says to you, and I've had this, not as obvious as a gift where somebody suggests to me that it might be beneficial in some way for me to take a certain stance or to say a certain thing or to bend something a certain way. Not nearly as blatant as this. Now, I can't control that somebody's saying this crap to me. But what I can do and what I do do is say, well, it doesn't matter that you'll be grateful because I'm just going to do my job properly anyway, whether anybody likes it or not. Whether that makes you mad at me or makes you happy with me is irrelevant. That's your problem, not mine. And, you know, if somebody goes further and actually offers you something, you've got to put your foot down. You have got to say, no, don't ever talk like that to me again. Don't ever even think about trying that crap. You're barking up the wrong tree. You got to tell him, you got to lay it out. Yes. 
And again, if you could uh, read through as far as uh, who's speaking and what the content of those messages are. Uh, I texted my sister, what's up? Uh, she responded, nothing. I s just saw Julie and she said, when this is all over, she wants to get you a thank you gift. And I respond, get Elizabeth one. The obvious, and I would argue necessary, comeback to somebody offering you any kind of benefit, whether that's a gift, whether that's putting in a good word somewhere, regardless of what it is, any benefit to you. You have to come back with making it clear that that's not going to fly here and don't even try. Don't even think about pulling that kind of crap with me ever again. And there are nice ways to say that. And some people are kind of chicken to say that, or maybe they're in a position where they can't really say that that explicitly. So they kind of ignore it and they're uncomfortable and they go away. But this year, what he says is get Elizabeth one. And we heard earlier, Elizabeth is Elizabeth Proctor, his wife. He has essentially agreed to accept a bribe. That is what he has just done. It doesn't matter that he didn't personally receive it himself. It doesn't matter whether ultimately his wife did receive a gift or not. He has essentially agreed to the bribe. Why does he have a job? Uh, Elizabeth's my wife. Uh, because, and my sister responds, because I guess her and Chris were friends with John, and she's so proud of you for leading this. And then she quite, writes, Elizabeth, question mark. I respond with, she's been stuck with the kids for the last 10 nights. My sister responded with, yeah, but she knew what life is like married to a cop. Somebody might make something of the line about, oh, she knew John O'Keefe, and so she's so proud of you for leading this. Well, listen, why is she proud of him if they're not that close? It doesn't make any sense. And really, I, I probably don't even have to say this, but I know that people are going to jump on that. This is, once again, exploiting tragedy, exploiting emotion, and using emotional concepts as a hook using, appealing to his ego, and that's part of a manipulation. You are so wonderful. I just know you're going to do this for me because you're terrific. And it works in the reverse too. And actually predators do this. Well, you wouldn't be rude to me for no reason, would you? No, you're not. Because they want you to live up to, either live up to the label or to prove that they're wrong. And what it is, is manipulation. So this statement about, oh, so proud of you and blah, 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 they care about John O'Keefe. It's not what it purports to be. It's obvious manipulation. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of pathetic because it is so obvious. But I guess it doesn't matter because he's saying, yeah, I'll accept that. Yeah, get the gift from my wife. Don't let them distract you. As far as the uh, gift that's mentioned, as far as Julie Albert, is that anything that you have received at any point in time? I never received a gift. I never asked for a gift. My wife never received a gift. She never asked for a gift. He never received a gift. It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter because of everything I just said like two minutes ago. I'm not going to repeat myself. He never asked for a gift. Okay. But he didn't decline it. And he actually did worse than not declining the gift. He says his wife never asked for a gift and never received a gift. While his wife is not the lead investigator or the case officer. So it doesn't matter that he didn't receive the gift, that he didn't ask for the gift. What is being left out and and this is a pattern through this whole trial is all the things that get glossed over, all the things that get omitted. And what the blatant thing that's being glossed over here is that he accepted the bribe. He said, tell her to get a gift for Elizabeth. He communicated that back. So that is not simply that he failed to push back, that he failed to say no. He not only accepted, but actually directed here, this is where the gift should go. But Lally wants to distract and omit. He's trying to prosecute somebody here, but I'd expect this from a defense lawyer. This is the prosecution. They should want the truth. How would you describe this context of this conversation or, or why that's being discussed uh, at this time? 
Again, I don't know the thought process of my sister and Julie as far as bringing that idea into the of a gift into play. Um, like I said, uh, I didn't ask for one. I never received one in the same in my life. True. He doesn't know the thought process, or maybe true, actually, because it might not be true. He doesn't control what other people say, but he does control how he responds, and he does control what he says, and he accepted the gift. Whether he actually received it or not, he said, yeah, give it to Elizabeth. But instead of dealing with that, he just kind of says, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. Okay, bud, what were you thinking? What the crap were you thinking that you wouldn't push back or you wouldn't say to your sister, you know better, you know better. Why is his sister comfortable saying this to him? Why does his sister know she could make a remark like that? Has he ever received benefit before from anybody else in relation to a case he was working on? Is this a thing? Sir, if I could direct your attention to page 2676. And again, if I could ask you to start at the top of the page and uh, read through and just indicate as far as uh, who is saying, uh, who is speaking and, and what they're talking. I start out, we write like eight to 12 warrants on each case. My sister responded, no, I have no idea what the hell you do or how it works. Uh, I responded uh, on the 10th at 7.36 p.m. I'm starving, but I also just want to go home. Thanks, though. Uh, my sister responds, yeah, but is dinner going to be waiting? Uh, she re responded with, ha, ha, ha. I re and then I responded, yep. And then my sister responded with, okay, it's fine. Mom and I just don't want to go home. And what do you recognize that? Uh, this is um, private messages between my wife and I. Wow. I'm saying wow that they that they got this and that this is being presented in court. And what is your wife's name? Elizabeth. And what if anything does that indicate as far as uh, dates and times and number of messages involved? Okay, so the first message sent um 520 2022 at 619 p.m. The last message sent 831 2022 at 9:16 p.m. And uh, what, if any, indication does it give as far as number of messages within that text? Here we go. You know it's going to be bad because Lally's saying, well, what's the big number of messages? Is it thousands? Because maybe only, you know, like five are going to be really bad. How many texts do you send over the course of many months, right? If you conspired to commit a homicide in two of those texts or one of those texts, is it fine or should it be disregarded because you made thousands of other unrelated texts over the, that same number of months? Are you uh, like, come on, I don't believe that the jury is actually kind of buying into this because it's ridiculous. I guess Lally has to give it a try. Okay. 1,632. And of those 1,162, there's one message that's listed on that. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, what is the date and time of that message? And what does it say? Who is speaking? Uh, this is me speaking on June 9th, 2022 at 4.56 p.m. I text my wife waiting to lock this whack job up. And what are you referring to in that text, sir? Um, I'm referring to the arrest after Ms. Reed was indicted by the grand jury. And again, uh, as far as the terminology uh, that you use in that text message to your wife, uh, why is it? Again, unprofessional messages I should not have sent. Um, I don't have an explanation other than they're regrettable and uh, it's something I'm not proud of, the language I use. Uh, so, Trooper Proctor, the jurors can't hear you. So speak directly into your microphone the way I'm doing, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Come to think of it, you know, she just had to tell him to speak into the mic. But earlier in the day, before lunch, he was bold in his speaking. There was no issue with him not speaking up. So he's bold when he makes the accusations. Bold when he's feeling confident like he's going to get her. Not so bold and not so loud now. Turn your attention back to uh, some of the comments on the language used in uh, the January 29th and February 1st uh, or 2nd uh, text communications among your friend group. Um, with reference um, to at that 
particular time frame and the language that you used. Um, what sort of information have you gathered to that point, and why would you say or use that particular language in your, particularly in your descriptions of the defendant? So this is, you know, 16, 18 hours later, uh, and we I conducted multiple interviews. We knew, Speak up. Conducted multiple interviews. We knew Mr. O'Keefe never went into Fairview Road. We knew there was one shoe at the scene, one shoe at the... He's not answering the question, but what he is doing is twofold already. First, he's providing an excuse for his behavior because he knows it's wrong. He's tired. And you know what? Yeah, messing up when you're tired is universal. But how you mess up and what the nature of the mess up is, is a different kind of question. It's a different conversation. He's tired. I get it. And he's going on about interviews he did. And and he says they knew that Mr. O'Keefe never went into Fairview. How does he know this? This is January 29th. How does he know that O'Keefe never went into Fairview? We're going back to questions I was asking right at the beginning. To all the civilian members of the public out there, if somebody committed a crime against you and you hear back from the investigating officer, yeah, I, I went and asked that guy. And you know what? He says he wasn't there. So, you know, and his friend says he wasn't there. So sorry about your luck. I, I'm just going to believe that. I'm going to believe that instead of actually investigating. And you know what? That kind of thing does happen because some people are lazy, regardless of the profession. So he doesn't know, really, that John O'Keefe never went into Fairview because by this point, he hasn't even had a chance to conduct a complete investigation. The scene was never secured. They never looked inside the house. He could say that with confidence. If they had done a search inside the house and really went over it really well, then they might be able to say, there's no indication that he ever went in that house, but they didn't. And there was evidence pointing to him having been in the house. And aside from the word of potential suspects, by this point, he has nothing to contradict that John was in the house. There's nothing except these people who he actually has a connection with saying, no, 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 it didn't happen. So this is garbage again. This is promoting a narrative. He had his mind made up very early. The whole thing from the get-go is tainted. If she was guilty, it's still tainted. And this whole thing is disgusting because somebody killed Officer John O'Keefe and they're getting away with it. There was one shoe at the scene, one shoe at the hospital. Mr. O'Keefe, based off Mr. O'Keefe's injuries, Ms. Reed's statements when Sergeant Buchanan and I interviewed her, her broken taillight, the missing taillight, uh, some taillight pieces found at the scene, the... Um, Compelling evidence pointing directly at Miss. Did you hear that? He almost said missing taillight piece. Reed that she struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle led me to make those comments. Whether, like I said, it was not they weren't professional comments, but based on the day's investigation, it was clear that Miss Reed had struck Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle. That's pathetic. That's his excuse. Yeah, I think she's guilty. I'm going to take this opportunity now to lay out the narrative. All the things I think. Here are all the pieces that I think lead me to this conclusion that, I mean, it's so compelling. And we're just going to exclude every other consideration. We're going to exclude all kinds of evidence because I've got tunnel vision and I want you to have it with me. And you know what? Even if she was guilty, even if they had done a thorough investigation, are you telling me that those disgusting texts that we heard at the beginning of this, that that somehow makes that okay? You know, these people are supposed to protect your rights. Anybody okay with that? You okay with a cop and a bunch of his buddies talking about you like that? Regardless of who you are. Are you good with a woman being degraded, objectified, being spoken about in that manner? Are you good with the remarks that show an utter lack of respect and a bias toward people with disabilities? You good with that? He thinks Karen Reed is guilty. Well, he wants to think that. But even if he honestly thought that, does that make those things okay? Are you good with 
having very intimate details about your your health information disclosed by some cop to his buddies and laughed about, mocked? How does that make this okay? The fact that he says he found, you know, they found the extra shoe and he thinks something. That somehow makes it okay. If you work in policing, you know how important it is to have the public's trust. It's actually a public safety issue and an officer safety issue. So when somebody calls the police, whether as a victim or a witness, somebody asking for help, you expect them to do their job. You hope they will. People make mistakes. That happens. How comfortable are you going to be calling the police after hearing that this guy spoke like this about a member of the public, an American citizen who he dealt with, and he's talking like that to his buddies about her. He's acting like that. It doesn't matter whether he thinks she's guilty or not. I mean, he reduced her to a piece of meat. So the fact that he thinks she's guilty doesn't make it okay. How comfortable is anyone then disclosing information to a police officer after seeing this? What does this do for victims of SA? You hear this crap that's going on and you're a victim of SA. Are you think twice about calling the cops because you might get one of these? You might have your intimate personal information just spread around and joked about because he has an opinion. So you know, who you are as a human being, be damned. This is disgusting. And the excuse making is disgusting. So the words coming out of his mouth, oh, that's regrettable, unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. This is the script I've learned. But there's an obvious failure to take responsibility because he's still making excuses and he's still redirecting focus while well, she's guilty. Like it all makes it okay. This guy should not be working in a position of power. Into the documents before you, do you recognize those? I do. And uh, <clears throat> as far as the participants in that particular conversation, uh, who were the participants listed to? Uh, it's Trooper David DeChico and myself. And Trooper DeChico and yourself uh, both work within the same unit with the state police, is that correct? That's correct. And beyond the professional relationship you have with yourself, uh, between yourself and Trooper DiCicco, how would you characterize your relationship, generally speaking? Uh, we're buddies, you know, <clears throat> we go off together, hang outside of work, you know, our kids play together. So I'd say, you know, we're friends. Now, within the, uh, again, as far as the first message sent date and time and last message sent date and time within this conversation, if you could describe that for the jury. Uh, first message sent date and time, March 17th, 2022, 11.08 a.m. Last message sent date and time, August 18th, 2022, 6.08 a.m. And again, the number of messages uh, listed within this uh, text chain? 87. And fair to say the documents before you do not contain 87 text messages, correct? That's correct, sir. Now, just in general terms, if you have an opportunity to just uh, look at the first couple pages there, um, fair to say those are just uh, sort of jokes uh, that you have going back and forth between yourself and Trooper DiCicco. Is that fair to say? Yes. Now, if I could turn your attention specifically to uh, page 2632, and uh, these are text messages uh, starting on April 28, 2022 at uh, 1052 in the morning. Is that correct? I'm sorry, what was the time again, sir? Uh, April 28th, 2022, 10.52 a.m. Yes, correct. And again, sir, with reference to uh, this page, if you could uh, read the content to the jury and please indicate uh, who is speaking at each respective times. Okay. Uh, I set out without a doubt. Um, he's got diarrhea of the mouth, too. Trooper to Chico, rookie move, not getting, not going into a meeting with the Emmy and getting that homicide determination. I respond... Yuri and I had two conference calls with her, sent her numerous photos, etc. We laid out the entire case for her. Trooper DeChico responds, not good enough, should have had me or Jeff do it. I respond, if you two did it, she would have made it accidental or natural causes. And can you explain the context of uh, those communications or, or what exactly is it that you and, and Trooper DiCicco are, are talking about in, in that communication? <laughs> to even set up for the question, Lally's framing this as a joke. It's not funny. 
so what we're hearing is a discussion about so who's got diarrhea of the mouth. What, what was that about? Who, who are they talking about? Maybe it has nothing to do with anything, but, you know, it makes me very curious. Anyway, unless I miss them. So the only part of this that's a joke is, yeah, well, if you did it, it would have turned out a different way, basically. That's just sort of that that banter that goes on. But the first part of this is serious. It's not a joke. Proctor and Buchanan are trying to convince the ME of something instead of following the evidence where it leads. They're trying to make the evidence fit what they want it to fit. So they have two conference calls with the ME and she's not saying what they want her to say and now they're trying to convince her. Why don't you let her say the truth about her area of expertise? If the ME does not rule it a homicide, if it's ruled, say, undetermined, they can still investigate. They can still pursue the matter. So they don't need to convince her. And if they rule that it's a homicide, if the ME does that, well, okay, so what? That doesn't necessarily convict Reed specifically. So it's not a joke. And they're trying to influence a medical examiner. They will tell a medical examiner, hey, this is the stuff we found at the scene. That's a reasonable thing because it helps inform on the background or what might be there. Sometimes a pathologist will miss something because they weren't aware that, say, there was a very rare poison found in a house and, you know, nobody tested for that. There are reasons they should communicate, legitimate reasons why the medical examiner's office and detectives should communicate. They're supposed to do that. They're supposed to provide information, but obviously they're trying to get her to say something. And it sounds like she won't. This is not a joke. The end part's a joke. Yeah, well, if you did it, it would have got, this is how it would have gone. That part's the joke, but clearly they're invested in an outcome and that's a problem. Okay. So the ME is the medical examiner. They conducted the autopsy of Mr. O'Keefe. Um, our office, it's kind of a little bit of a locker room. Hold on, wait for the ambulance and then... So like I said, the ME stands for medical examiner uh they conducted the autopsy of mr o'keefe he um because i'll address the conference calls sergeant Buchanan and i have with the medical examiner the doctor had some questions uh as to the facts and evidence kind of what i transpired which is common you know even if it's if it's a homicide i've had many calls with the medical examiner's office even if it's a suicide or over he just said even if it's a homicide but always, uh, always, all, almost, all, I wouldn't say almost, always with a homicide, the doctor wants to know what transpired. Trooper Chico and myself, we kind of like to bust, bust each other's chops, go back and forth. So that's what he meant by saying, um, rookie move, not going into a meeting with the ME and, and getting that homicide determination. I have to laugh. He is busting his chops. I think it was my last video. I said he's a double rookie because somehow he hardly worked on the road and somehow he ends up in homicide. It's becoming clear now that he's got a lot of friendships inside. Yeah, he's busting his chops, but I wonder if the rookie comment got to him. But that's the thing that gets said. Yeah, you're a rookie. And I have a friend who used to always say, that would be called a clue. Things like that. The original determination came back. Uh, what? Sustained. Next question, Mr. Marley. <clears throat> now, as far as um, attending the autopsy, is that something that typically someone within your office would do, uh, within your unit would do with regard to uh, any sort of death investigation? Yes. And uh, do you know who attended the autopsy, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, in this specific case? Uh, Trooper Con O'Keefe. And so as far as Trooper Chico's reference to you not going uh, in or Sergeant Mechanic not going in, is that what you believe Trooper Chico was referring to in that message? Objection. Sustained as to the form. Um, you indicated that uh, you and Trooper Chico bust each other's chops. Is that fair to say? Yes. And can you describe a little more, expound upon that as far as the nature of your relationship and sort of the, the text messages that you exchange in this and any other communications that you have? Um, basically, just, you know, kind of needling each other and him, him doing that is by saying, texting me, rookie move, uh, not going into meeting with the uh, medical examiner. Um, so that's a perfect example of him kind of just needling me, which we do on a daily basis. 
this is interesting because there are a couple of layers here. Lolly and this witness are discussing the surface layer, which is, yeah, we're needling each other. We do that. And yeah, that's what they're doing. But there's a little bit more here, which is that the goal of Proctor is to get a certain result out of the medical examiner. And by focusing on the banter and excusing the banter, the joking, by putting the jury's focus there, they're distracted from that other layer, which is Proctor is trying to get a certain result, trying to make the evidence fit what he wants it to fit instead of him following the evidence. Also, I note that there was some other trooper completely who attended the autopsy. And I think that's an important little detail. I'll just stick a pin in that. As far as your interpretation of that, did you interpret that as a serious comment or something said in jest? I interpreted that as a typical joke from uh, Trooper to Chico. <clears throat> you recognize that? To be? Uh, <clears throat> text messages between me, me, myself and uh, Trooper to Chico. <clears throat> and again, what is the first message sent day and time? Last message sent day and time and number of messages contained therein. Uh, first message sent date and time April 28th, 2022 at 1.09 p.m. Last message sent date and time April 28th, 2022, 4.45 p.m. And the number of messages, sir? Four. Read the contents of those messages contained there. So I start out, of course, it's undetermined. Uh, she was a whack job. Oh, really? He apologizes earlier about his unprofessional comments about Miss Reed. You know, on April 28th, 2022, at one o'clock in the afternoon, was he tired? Had he been up for 16 hours? Huh? I know the medical examiner is a she, and I think that matters. He is showing us who he is. She didn't give him what he wanted. And why does he want that so bad? The facts are the facts. The truth is the truth. If your evidence is so compelling, then it'll stand on its own. You don't have to worry about it. Tributa Chico responds, dear God, WTF, what the hell is inconclusive about the whole thing? And as far as your indication there, as far as she was a whack job, who are you referring to there? Uh, Miss Reed. Really? Really? He's referring to Miss Reed? The start of the conversation. This is about the Emmy's office. Of course, it's undetermined. She was a whack job. They're talking about the Emmy, not Reed was a whack job. That's not who they're talking about. I don't believe this. I don't believe that he's talking about Reed. I don't. I think he's mad at the medical examiners. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he was talking about Reed and maybe that will come out somehow. Let's say he was talking about Reed and he thinks Reed is a whack job. Well, what does that have to do with what the medical examiner says? How is one connected to the other? I think this person is a whack job. Therefore, they committed crime. Therefore, this medical examiner needs to say a particular thing to fit my opinion of this other person. Is that what it is? You know, I don't believe this mealy mouth little worm anyway. Talking about what, what is sort of the content or the context of this conversation? That would be the uh, manner of death was determined to be undetermined by the medical examiner's office. And so I ask you again, as far as your reference there in the bottom of the first page, as far as she was a whack job, whom do you believe you're referring to there? Again. Ms. Reed or the medical examiner? Miss Reed. Even Lally knows better. And what do you recognize those to be? Uh, another text thread between myself, Trooper DeChico, and Trooper Kukowski. And Trooper Kaskowski is another trooper within your unit in the state police, is that correct? Yes. And again, if you could read from the first message sent, date and time, and the last message sent, date and time. Uh, first message sent, date and time, 5-24-2022, p.m. Last message sent, date and time, 8-24-2022, 4-56 p.m. <coughs> And as far as the number of messages uh, indicated within this text chain between yourself, Trooper Kukowski, and Trooper DeChico? 494. Fair to say the documents before you do not contain 494 text messages, correct? Correct. Just in reference to that first page 2635, first message sent, that's May 24th, 2022, around 921 p.m., is that correct? Yes. And that's a message sent from uh, Trooper Kukowski. Kaskowski, is that correct? Correct. And what is that? Uh, appears to be a picture of a toy Santa Claus. 
If I could direct you to the bottom of the page, sir, and see the text from yourself at June 9, 2022 at 11.19 p.m. He just glossed right over that. May 24th, a picture of toy Santa. What does Santa bring? Gifts? What happens at Christmas in many North American or American households? Gifts. Receiving. You tell me that picture Santa doesn't mean anything? Yeah, come on. If you could read what you wrote on June 9th, 2022, uh, around that time, sir. I feel like women who shit themselves. And again, sir, uh, what is it that you're referring to there? Um, again, a regrettable comment I made about Miss Reed's medical condition. I don't even know what to say. He's pathetic. He is disgusting. This is not a regrettable comment. Was he tired on June 9th, 2022? Was he tired? Is that why he said that? Because he was tired? Maybe that's why. Maybe he's just tired. And this other trooper is engaging in this, and we've seen it before. This is not, I'm tired, I didn't like her, I thought she was guilty. At no time are we hearing any compassion or outrage or anything in reference to what happened to Officer John O'Keefe. That's not what we're hearing. That's not what this is about. There's no outrage for O'Keefe. There's no concern there. That's not what this is about. This is about this woman who is a piece of meat and we don't like her. This is about women and people with disabilities and people who don't give these guys what they want. And you know why? Why is this other? Why are these other troopers participating in this? Right? They have a little gang here. That's what it is. It's a disgusting, worse than juvenile little gang. And they want to just call that unprofessional. It's a regrettable comment. No, it's not. It's a pattern of behavior now. This is what this establishes. This is a pattern of behavior, not a one-off. Not a, I got pissed off one day and said something. Pattern of behavior. This is a demonstration of a way of thinking, a thought pattern. This is a demonstration or an external sign of an attitude that they all in this conversation have. And this other trooper is participating. It would be bad if the other trooper doesn't say, hey, what the hell is wrong with you? Knock it off. What's wrong with you, guy? Like, what? how old are you? What rock did you crawl out from under? I don't talk like that. You certainly don't talk like that about civilians or, I mean, people you're supposed to serve and protect. We're not supposed to be talking like this. Why are you saying that crap? What's wrong with you that you have an issue with women or you have an issue with people with disabilities? What's wrong with you? Maybe you need some help, pal. So it's bad enough that the others don't call him on it at all, but they participate. Earlier, he made reference to something similar that the chief would call people. There is a systemic problem here. There is a cultural, organizational, systemic problem here. And it's going to take more than dealing with one guy or being seen to deal with one guy to clean it up. And it appears, given by the fact that this guy is still working, that they're not interested in cleaning it up, which is a shame. Now, if I could <coughs> direct you to the following page, 2645. I'm speaking right now. The statement she made at, tonight at 8-7 was mental. Thank Christ it was on BWC, which is body, worn camera. Uh, Trooper Kukowski responds, that's her. Smoke. Trooper Kukowski again, what she say? I respond, said the Alberts beat the shit out of O'Keefe, left him for dead, and that's why her taillight was cracked. She's gross. Trooper Chico, oh, fuck her, bitch. Reed has made an allegation. It has to be investigated properly. I'm sure you're sitting there thinking you're joking, Lori, because you expect something to be properly investigated, given from the very beginning of this case, they didn't bother. In fact, they went to a lot of trouble to not bother. They went out of their way to not be bothered. And she's gross and F her? Really? So she's making an allegation. And we're not seeing the Albert's basement being luminoled? Why? Why? And he says, thank goodness it was caught on body-worn camera. And yes, thank goodness it was caught on body-worn camera. So I hope we're going to see that in its entirety without, you know, minutes missing or anything, or maybe the battery died. He's hearing a very serious allegation and he dismisses it and their attitude is of her. Real professional guys. Sir, with reference to that last bit as far as uh, June 9th, 2022, uh, what was going on that day in reference to... Uh... <laughs> 
to this matter again? Uh, Ms. Reed, Ms. Reed was being processed at the Milton Barracks. Another text thread uh, with um, members from my office, troopers. <clears throat> and who are the troopers that are listed uh, within that? Uh, Trooper Chris Moore, Trooper Jeff Kukowski, uh Lieutenant John Fanning, Trooper Dave DeChico, and Sergeant Yuri Buchanan. And what is the first message sent, uh, date and time? Uh, that would be 5-26-2022 at 8-19 p.m. Last message sent, date and time, 8-26-2022, 5-36 p.m. And what is listed as far as the number of messages within this chain? 651. And fair to say the documents before you do not contain all 651 of those messages within this chain. Is that correct? Correct. I know that Lally is getting him to read out how many messages are in the chain. Lally wants to sort of bring out that there's a lot of messages and there aren't going to be very many really bad ones. But it kind of jumped out at me that there were, oh, I didn't write it down, 600 and some odd messages. And this is with troopers and one of them is Buchanan. And Buchanan is his superior officer, or his supervisor. So that they would have that many text messages in a group chat over a personal cell phone indicates that they have a friendship outside of work. That number, I know what Lally is trying to do. I think that number is an important little detail. We'll see a message uh, sent from Trooper DeChico on uh, August 17th, 2022 at 9.42 p.m. Yes. And is that an image uh, contained on the next page, which is 2683? Yes, it is. And what is the image of? Uh, <clears throat> that is a picture of Mr. Yanetti. Appears to be from uh, quite some time ago. And there's a response from you, August 17th, 2022 at 9.44 p.m. Is that correct? Okay, so these came from me. Funny, I'm going through his retarded client's phone. No nude so far. I hate that man. I truly hate him. There are a lot of pieces here. DeChico sounds I'm an old picture of Yanetti. I don't personally think it's a big deal that somebody doesn't like a particular attorney or especially in smaller jurisdictions, people talk, people say things like, ah, these big out of town attorneys, they don't understand how to work in a small jurisdiction. They come in here and want to run everything. You hear things like that. You hear things like, oh, you know, this particular lawyer, he's always doing X. YZ or he's stepping out on his wife or whatever. I mean, people do that stuff, right? People make remarks. People say, I don't like that guy. But this goes a little bit further. And it's that somebody actually is invested enough to go dig out an old picture of Yanetti? Really? That's what you want to focus on and do in your, in your spare time? Is that what you want to do? Wouldn't you rather be playing with your dog or hanging out with your friends or going fishing or hunting or something? Go play hockey? Something? This is what you're doing? You're looking up old pictures of this lawyer? Really? So that shows you that there's a level of investment here. I don't care if somebody doesn't like somebody. Yeah, you know, people don't like me either. So but this is a step further than that. And the focus is more, actually more on Reed than it is on Reed's lawyer. And it's clear that the actual focus, the contempt is toward Reed. Once again, degrading her. He's covering some bases here. Women, people who don't do what I want, people with physical disabilities, people with mental health problems, people with developmental disabilities. I mean, we're racking up quite the list here. And the nudes. I don't know how on earth you rehabilitate this. There's absolutely no way to rehabilitate this. There is no excuse. No nudes is not funny. It is not funny. And he's sitting there going through Reed's phone. And as he's engaged in this official duty, this is his mindset while he is going through the phone. Was he really looking for nudes or is he cracking a joke that is not funny? Personally, I think if he found nudes, he would have looked at them. So this is his state of mind while he's looking through a suspect's phone. You're telling me that has no impact on anything? I don't think there's much I can say. I've seen this 
kind of crap before. I've heard it before. And it disgusts me and it makes me angry. I've got no words strong enough. He's a pathetic loser. And he is abusing his power. He is abusing his power and he is exploiting a civilian. This civilian female with disabilities, suspect or not, she is vulnerable. He has power over her and this is what he does. This is how he's treating her. This attitude toward her. Going through your phone, looking for noon. How many DV victims or SA victims would want this guy to be looking through their phone? How many of you would trust this guy? Guys, how many of you trust this guy with your daughters? You good? You good with that? He's supposed to serve and protect. Put all these things together into a package because we have a pattern of attitude, behavior. We have patterns. It's not, these aren't one-offs. This is who he is. And this other trooper is participating in this. These other guys are not pushing back at all. There's a video clip I want to show you. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to put it at the end of this video. So stay tuned for that. With reference to uh, the investigation at this point, you're talking about his client's phone. Who are you referring to? Miss Reed. And with regards uh, to uh, the phone at that point, uh, can you describe for the jury sort of what's going on uh, during this time period of August 17, 2022 in regards to uh, Miss Reed's phone? So after obtaining a search warrant from Miss Reed's phone, we weren't able to extract any data from it until August of 2023. Troopers in my office knew I was going through the phone that evening. I was most interested in location data, text messages, Google searches. Um, that was the update I gave uh, the troops in the office. It was a. So he's looking for text messages, location data. Uh, but what he's saying is, you know, uh, I haven't come across any nude photos yet. And we're supposed to think that he's professional. And not only that, he's doing it in the context. He's doing all this stuff at the moment he's conducting this in investigation that this is how he's thinking this is how he is it's is he like what planet is he from that anybody's gonna believe that he's not biased that it has no impact on the investigation of course it does and why isn't anybody shutting this a-hole down during all these texts they're all going along with it they're helping him the other guy spent time like looking up this old picture of yanetti why are you so invested in that buddy serve and protect you know, some people wear a different color blue. A distasteful joke. I should have gave a proper update instead of that. Um, I wasn't able to go through the phone. How many distasteful jokes do you get to make in the course of your professional duties before somebody shuts you down? Apparently, that didn't happen. Was he tired on August 17th? Was he, t did he, had he worked 16 hours and he was so tired that, you know, it just slipped out? He messed up? Doesn't sound like it. This is not a distasteful joke. This is a pattern of behavior. This is an attitude that he holds. This is how he thinks. And he feels like it's okay. And I know he's sitting here saying the words he's supposed to say because he's caught. He's minimizing through this scripted excuse. He's minimizing what he's done. It's not distasteful. It is disgusting. It is base. It is beyond unprofessional. It's not funny. It's not a distasteful joke. And he's supposed to be actually working during the time that this is happening. So that is his mental state as he is going through the phone of a citizen, a civilian, a woman with some health issues, a citizen he's supposed to serve and protect. That is his attitude as he's going through that. That's not unbiased. That's not even clear headed. So he's going to sit here and utter words of, yeah, that was distasteful and I shouldn't have done it. Does that work for him before? Because this wasn't a one off or a distasteful joke. It is who this guy is. And he should never be in a position of power over anybody vulnerable, especially not women, people with mental health issues, people with developmental disabilities, and people with physical disabilities. And God knows what else is on his list. He shouldn't be allowed anywhere near any of them. How's that work? You go to a police officer because you want help, because you want protection. It doesn't matter that she's an accused because he's supposed to treat all civilians, all citizens the same. Everybody has the same constitutional rights, at least in theory. As thoroughly as possible because I came across some uh, um, text between an attorney and Ms. Reed, so I had to stop going through her phone and I made my supervisor aware of those communications. 
Now, just in reference to what you just said, this is in August of uh, 2022. Is that correct? Correct. After a search warrant is obtained for the defendant's phone, um, where did it go? You, you indicated you gave it to Trooper Garino, and, and where did it go from there? Trooper Garino um, essentially hooks it up to a device called Gray Key, where it tries every possible combination uh, passcodes in order to access the data contained in the phone. And at that time, when you retrieved it pursuant to the search warrant, you didn't have the passcode to the defendant's phone. Is that correct? Correct. So that device is designed to sort of go through numbers and, and try to find a combination to get into the phone, correct? Correct. And so from the time that you had seized it in late January or on January 29th, 2022, until this date in August of 2022, uh, had you been able to get into the phone or see anything in the phone uh, in those intervening months or seven months between January and August? No. And so then at this time that you're sending this text message in August of 2022, is that around the time that you uh, were first able to access the phone? Yes, that was the first time we were able to have access to the phone. With reference uh, to uh, your access to the phone, um, were you looking for, for nudes or anything like that in regard to the defense? Objection. I'll allow it. You know, like I stated, I was most interested in Ms. Reed's location data, text communications, Google searches, things of that nature. He says on the stand, now that he's confronted, he was most interested in her location and text data and all of that. Except, you know, when he's talking to these other troopers, he is, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying anything about, yeah, I can't find location data, or I did find it, or I'm looking for this, that, or the other thing. He's talking about newts and referring to her in a most disgusting, derogatory manner. He's not talking about work stuff. How many times has this guy lied and excused himself, excused his behavior and expected to get away with it? I'm betting a lot. I'm betting he fully expects to get away with it. And you know, the fact that he's actually still working suggests that he will get away with it. More evidence uh, contained within the phone. And so, sir, <clears throat> you mentioned at some point you came across some information uh, that caused you to sort of freeze your, your looking through the phone. Is that correct? Yes. And so as far as that specific time period in August of 2022, when was the next time that uh, you or any troopers from your office were able to actually look at any extraction of the defendant's phone? So once I came across that text communication uh, that took place on the 29th, uh, between Ms. Reed and an attorney, uh, it, the phone had to be sent off to what they call a taint team to remove it. Catch that? He just slid something in there because he's going to stick it to Reed. He really hates her. He's going to stick it to her. He has to make sure that he gets out in his testimony that Reed contacted her lawyer on the 29th. And I don't know that he should actually be saying that at all. But I think that's what he was just trying to do right here is to to throw that in. And you know what? If Reed contacted her lawyer on the 29th, well, yeah. You know, if the police came to my house and seized my vehicle and my phone, yeah, I'd be calling a lawyer. Are you kidding me? Yeah. She'd have to be stupid not to call an attorney. But they're trying to make that into something here. This witness, actually, Lally didn't try to get that out of him. This witness is trying to make something of that any attorney client privilege information from the phone and then it would be returned to us as well as defense received a copy of that as well uh, i'm not positive on the time it was quite it was a quite a long turnaround for that process to have be complete completed sometime at least in the spring or summer of 2023 does that sound about right it sounds about right the cross-examination is coming i leave you with the words of lieutenant General David Morrison. He is addressing the Australian army, but the message applies. It applies to policing and it should apply to other organizations as well. And it applies on a personal level. Have a listen. All operations, female soldiers and officers have proven themselves worthy of the best traditions of the Australian army. They are vital to us maintaining our capability now and into the future. If that does not suit you, then get out. You may find another employer where your attitude and behaviour is acceptable, but I doubt it. The same goes for those who think that toughness is built on humiliating others. Every one of us is responsible for the culture and reputation of our army and the environment in which we work. 
If you become aware of any individual degrading another, then show moral courage and take a stand against it. No one has ever explained to me how the exploitation or degradation of others enhances capability or honours the traditions of the Australian Army. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That goes for all of us, but especially those who by their rank have a leadership role. If we are a great national institution, if we care about the legacy left to us by those who have served before us, if we care about the legacy we leave to those who, in turn, will protect and secure Australia, then it is up to us to make a difference. If you're not up to it, find something else to do with your life. There is no place for you amongst this band of brothers and sisters.